All right, there we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Jim, as Steve said, uh, one of the broadcasters here with the team, uh, also a ticket sales rep. So there may be some of you here uh, in the Zoom that may be familiar with me that I've uh, dealt with you over the phone, but uh, glad to have you with us for, as Steve said, our inaugural winter weekend here. And it really is a, uh, a winter weekend at that with uh, what we've got going on outside. But um, thrilled to be joined by a guy who probably around these parts does not need much of an introduction, 2003 All-Star and, of course, 2004 World Series champion Keith Folk. Keith, thanks for spending some time with us here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I hear the weather's pretty shaky up there, so I'm glad to be in, you know, in Southwest Florida right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right, so I want to start with right after 2003 with this conversation, obviously coming off a an all-star campaign for you out in Oakland, you're a free agent and you get a call from the Red Sox. What were your initial thoughts on that and what led you to deciding on coming to Boston? Um, well, you know, I watched the, the 2003 playoffs just like everybody else and saw what happened to the Red Sox and, you know, against that series with the Yankees. Um, and I remember my dad saying, you know, when we were watching that, he goes, hey, I'll guarantee you're playing in Boston next year. They're going to need you. And I kind of laughed about it. You know, I, Oakland was a fun place to play. It was nice and easy. Um, but, you know, I came to visit o or, uh, Boston and, you know, and and it kind of – it really kind of boiled down to it's like I really wanted a chance to win a championship. Uh, and after sitting down and talking with Theo and, you know, a lot of the other front office and uh, uh, Terry Francona was going to be the new manager over there, which so I was familiar with him from Oakland. So – it just seemed like, uh, you know, seemed like a great fit and, you know, came to Boston uh, hunting championships. So from there, you show up to spring training and was it there in Fort Myers or was there a certain moment during that season in 04 where you realized, hey, this might be the team to go all the way to break the curse of the Bambino? I know there are a lot of people who will point to the Veritech and A-Rod game at the end of July is a turning point for you guys. But in your mind, was that sort of a turning point? Was that the moment? Or is there a different one from your perspective where you said, okay, I think we may have something special here? Well, I mean, we knew we had something special. You know, the day we walked out of, uh, you know, the, the door in spring training, you know, it's like that, that team was built. You know, the, they already had a great core of guys. And then, you know, uh, you bring in Kurt Schilling over, myself over, and, you know, it's not like they were a shabby team to begin with, but you added our two, you know, our two arms in there, and, you know, it was just kind of difference. But we knew what we were there for. We knew day one of spring training, we were there to win a World Series. And so, um, obviously, we didn't play as well as we wanted to most of the time, but, you know, we, we were experienced enough to know that we had a job to do. And, um, you know, like I said, a little shaky up and down a point, but, you know, we got it done in the end. So about a week after the crazy Veritech and A-Rod, Bill Miller walk-off, I think that was July 24th, if I'm not mistaken. A week later, the trade deadline comes. And then obviously, Nomar gets dealt the big four-team deal. What was it like being in the clubhouse when all that was going down? And just from your perspective, was there just this shock amongst the guys? And, and just what sort of was the vibe? Um, you know, I wouldn't say there was a whole lot of shock. I don't, I don't really remember, you know, what it was really like. But, you know, we were all professionals in there. Uh, Nomar had been hurt, you know, throughout the year. And so it's, you know, sometimes the, the writing is on the wall and anybody can, you know, can read it. But, um, you know, Nomar's a great guy, and the front office did what they needed to do, and, you know, and, and it, it set us up. And, uh, you know, we got uh, Orlando Cabrera came in and played shortstop for us, and, you know, it's, you know, it was, it was a solid team. But, you know, it's when you've been around the game long enough, those trades, it's like, it's like, it's part of the business. You know, it's just kind of, okay, you know, you get a new coworker, one leaves, one comes in, and you, know, you just kind of deal with it. But, you know, it's, uh, it didn't change our focus at all. So that move, as you said, it, it ultimately catapults you guys down the stretch. You went on a tear in August, September. You clinched the wild card. You sweep the Angels in the first round. And then come the Yankees again in the ALCS. 
then comes the 03 deficit. So not not a great spot, obviously, but you guys show no, up. That's not how you want to draw it up. No, no for, for sure. So you guys show up for game four at Fenway, and you've got Kevin Millar going around saying, don't let us win today, don't let us win today. Did you guys think he was nuts or what? <laughs> well, you know, yeah, we all thought he was nuts, but that before didn't start him, on right? Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know what? It's yeah, it was, it was funny that all that stuff was being documented. But when you get put in that situation, we didn't get put in that situation. We we played ourselves in that situation. You know, it comes down to it. It's like you you win, you play again, or you lose, you pack up, you go home. So it's like it got to a point where the pressure was off. You know, we were already had our backs as far up against the wall as you could be. And it, it really just kind of took the pressure off. And, you know, Kevin's running around saying all that stuff, but it was really true. It's like, let's go out and play a good ball game today and see what happens. You know, and obviously we went out there and battled and, you know, won that one. And, you know, it's like, all right, hey, let's do it again tomorrow. Let's do it again tomorrow. You know, and, and definitely once we got uh, won that game six was obviously a huge game. But going into game seven, you know, you could see that the pressure was completely on them. Uh, you know, we get uh, Johnny goes up and hits a couple home runs in the first few innings. Also, we kind of throw a little gap on him, and you can just see it right there. That's we were focused, and you know, there was no turning back. So it seems like obviously you guys had nothing to lose, as you said, right? And it was sort of a, a no pressure situation. Yeah. But did your confidence ever waver, even being down 0 3? Um, well, it, you know you're going to act professional. You're going to put on your game face no matter what. But it's like, yeah, it's, you know, we, we knew that we were in a tight spot. Um, but again, it's like, it's not like we were really young players. We had, you know, pretty much the whole team had been through the playoffs before. So it's that experience that you come from, from losing in the past that helps you prepare yourself to move forward and, you know, become a, you know, eventually, you know, winning a championship. But, um, you know, you're professionals. The, the confidence doesn't waver, you know, too much. It's, you know, it's me against you, you know, and hopefully I did my job and, you know, and got you out. So you guys go on and obviously complete the greatest comeback in postseason history. And then comes the World Series with the Cardinals and <laughs> game four, you're on the mound. Edgar Interia chops the grounder right back to you and the toss to Doug Mankiewicz. He hits that ball. It's coming back to you. You're making your way over towards the first baseline. Just what's going through your mind in that moment in time? Yeah, so my, my thought was, hey, you know, obviously we've all seen the videos and stuff. It's like, hey, don't throw this ball away. You know, but there was, I may have been, I may have used different terms, but I was thinking myself, just kind of double pump it. And I'm like, maybe one more step. And then you kind of let that ball fly. And, you know, not everything kind of just was in warp speed at that point. But, you know, just don't screw it up. <laughs> Um, Keith, you, you'd obviously had been around the league for quite a while since joining the Red Sox. I know you've touched on it a couple of different times and that this was a team that was built to win already coming off of 03. And there were a lot of veterans in that clubhouse, but as far as the chemistry goes, everyone obviously refers to them as the idiots, right? Or you guys as the idiots from that team. But chemistry wise, well, makeup wise, yeah. <laughs> I'm not lumping you into that. I know that 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 there are some some people. Yeah. There. But um, as far as the makeup goes and the chemistry, what made that 04 team so different compared to other teams that you had been on prior to that? Um, it's kind of what I touched on earlier: is the experience. Um, the entire, you know, I was 30 or 31 at, during that season. And I was, I was one of the younger guys on that team, you know, our, our bullpen and, you know, starting uh, rotation. It's like, you're talking all-stars and, you know, Cy Youngs and, and, and world series MVPs. And, you know, it's, it was just, it was an easy team to play for because everybody was there for the same reason, you know, nobody was like trying to work on getting their multi-year deal and, you know, there was no more drama. It was just everybody's there to play ball every single day. And, you know, like it says, you know, if you're, if you're having fun, you know, it's not work. And uh, we really had a great time playing together and we wanted to play for each other. You know, we were, you know, we'd go out to eat and, you know, there was always 10, 12, 15 of us. So it was, uh, it was a very tight knit group. 
obviously big news shifting gears a little bit, but still staying in touch with that 04 team. One of your former teammates, David Ortiz, getting the call to the hall yeah. this week on the first ballot. Just your thoughts on David and and what was it like being his teammate? Um, great guy. You know, he, uh, you know, the person that you see on TV and, and commercials and all this stuff. I mean, that's who he is. He's a fun loving guy. Uh, you know, he, he cares when, you know, when, when kids would come into the clubhouse, he was always the first one to, you know, give him a hug, a high five. And he always had time for, you know, for them. And, uh, even after, you know, after, since we're all out of game now, you see him around Fenway, it's like, Hey David, and it's like, Hey, it comes over and, you know, says hello and talks to the kids and, yeah, he's just he's just a great guy. And uh yeah, I'm proud of him and you know, I'm honored to be one of his teammates and uh you know, to say that I actually got to play with uh you know with the Hall of Famer, another Hall of Famer. Do you have any untold David Ortiz stories that you could share with the group here? Any anything that you know is not out there that <laughs> you know had happened that you could you could share here? Uh not no, not really. I mean it's you know, it's social media and everything is you can't really hide a whole lot of stuff anymore. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything I can I can add that everybody doesn't already know. Awesome. Um, so Sorry. You, hey, <laughs> not a problem. Um, you've obviously been, you know, still involved um, with the organization over time. Um, and we've seen you make stops, you know, back in Pawtucket at McCoy Stadium and whatnot. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm curious what are your thoughts on this collection of minor leaguers? Because obviously, you know, it, with the lockout going on, there's some restrictions as to, you know, who we can and can't talk about, but you know, the guys coming up through the system, obviously we can. So from what you've seen and with high and bloom and company taking over and what's now at the, at the levels of the minor league system, just your thoughts on where this group of minor leaguers is headed for the Red Sox. Um. Well, when you spend a lot of time with these young guys, it's like you obviously believe in them. And, um, but that's what's tricky about baseball is, is the guys who can, you know, get to that double AA, A, triple A, obviously have the talent to play in the big leagues. Uh, but once you get to the big leagues, that's another pretty big step that you got to, you know, that you got to navigate. But, you know, it's you go out there every day and you work with these guys and, you know, you get to believing in them. So, I mean, I'm always an I'm an optimist, so it's, I think they're you know a good young crop, and uh, the Red Sox have done a pretty good job to to keep their minor leagues uh, stocked over the last couple of years instead of trading everybody off. And um, you know, I, I like what's coming up, and you know, hopefully once they get to the big leagues and you know play under the lights in Fenway, that you know they can come through and you know make us proud. As far as sticking on the minor league topics go, um, I know you got to come out and check out Polar Park last year in the inaugural year. Um, just your thoughts on on Polar Park, what you thought of the place, and what does it mean to have a AAA club be as close to Fenway? I know Pawtucket was still fairly close, but you know, being in the same states, I know it's it's similar distance wise, but mentally wise, that's a pretty big deal to have Worcester right off the pike from Boston. Yeah, you know, especially uh, the the days of, you know, that we're in now where they're calling guys up left and right. Uh, having your AAA affiliate and even AA, you know, for that, for that fact, is being able to put a phone call on. I don't know how many times, you know, being in Pawtucket where we had a starter for a, you know, 7 o'clock game, 5.30, hey, I need this guy in Boston to start, you know, in the bullpen tonight, whatever it was. It's like, Hey guys, they're on their craft in a bag and they're hitting the road. And when you can be from your AAA affiliate to your big league stadium in under an hour, it's a huge, uh, you know, it's a huge benefit, you know, cause you, you know, obviously keeping the big league stocked with players is, is the most important thing. So, you know, having that close is, uh, you know, is a, is a great asset and polar park is, you know, beautiful place. Awesome. Um, let's get to some of the questions here, uh, from the fans in the chat. Um, I'll start with Steve's question. Um, interesting one. Um, Keith, can you talk about how relievers don't get a lot of respect for hall of fame voting? I mean, I think you see it Keith with obviously closers, right? Because you can point to saves and, you know, the voters point at statistics, right. But, you know, as far as, you know, middle relievers and some of those other guys, I think maybe Steve has a point when it comes to that. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, being a middle reliever is, is not the most glamorous job on the uh, on the roster, but uh, you know, it still pays pretty well. And um, you know, players just have to realize that not every player is going to be a Hall of Famer. You know, I, I think I had a pretty decent career, and you know, I'm not even we're close to being thought about to even be on a ballot. So it's uh, you know, you got to go out, love your middle relievers, love the bullpen guys, but. I mean, unless you're one of the elite closers, you know, you'll never even, you know, never even sniff that ballot. Another question here from Dave and Deb Penta um, talking about just how lights out you were in 04. And we had Mo Vaughn in a separate um, Zoom chat earlier, Keith, and uh, we were talking about the expectations of playing in Boston and, and the market and just the intensity of the fan base, the media and whatnot. Is that something that you embraced? Is that something that you thrived off of being in a pressure, you know, cook situation like this? Because obviously, you know, you excelled with that. But uh, so you're talking about like the expectations and stuff, right? Yeah. So I, I've told this story a few times, but so when I was on my official visit, um, yeah, I'm a big hockey fan. So, um, wanted to go to a Bruins game, whatever, ended up going to Celtics game. They gave me a Bobby Orr jersey when I left. And uh, I got home and sometime, you know, three or four days later, you know, I, I saw there was a voicemail on my phone and uh, I opened it up and, you know, listened to it. It was Bobby Orr called and left me this, this message about what it's like to play in Boston. Uh, you know, he was very honest and he's like, hey, you know, it's, it can be tough. And when you don't play well, you know, there's a lot of passion. The fans will boo you. They'll do all this stuff. But he goes, the one thing is when you win, there's no better city to win a championship in. And uh, I remember hearing that. And I remember hollering out to the wife at the time, hey, pack your stuff or we're going to Boston. That was the, uh, you know, that was the nail that uh, that finished it off for me. Good stuff. That's a great story. Um, Leanne has a question here, very detailed question. Keith, you threw a lot of pitches in games four, five, and six of the ALCS in 04. Those scoreless innings in game four helped set up the pitching staff for the rest of the series. Would you have been able to go in a save situation in a close game in game seven if necessary? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's really, it's, it, it, that's why you train every day. You know, you train and, um, you train every day so you can be ready. And yeah, I was tired and I was worn out, but uh, you know, the training staff and uh, we had a great massage guy, Russell, that, uh, that took care of us. And, you know, he, he got us out in the field every day. And like I said, the training staff was there anytime you need them, but uh, you train out your whole life for that, that moment. And it's like one of those things that there's nothing, you know, nothing keep me off the field. Awesome. Well, I think that's uh all the questions that we have. And uh, I think we can wrap it there. That was great. Keith Fulk, yeah. 2004 World Series champ. Thanks for hanging out with us. Appreciate it. Thanks. We'll see you guys soon. Steve, we'll toss it back over to you. Awesome. Yes. Uh, thank you, Keith, really, for, for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, a reminder, single game tickets for April and May are on sale now. Uh, Woosocks.com or 508-500-8888. Uh, so many of you I'm sure have already, have already done so, but if you haven't yet, please go ahead and do so now. Guarantee the, the seats you want for the games you want. A lot of great uh, promotions this year as well. So please check that out. Uh, again, woosocks.com, 508-500-8888. Uh, and again, reminder, any questions throughout the year on the Booster Club, uh, please boosterclub at woosocks.com. Be sure to download the app, Worcester Red Sox Booster Club at the App Store. And uh, we really are looking forward to seeing you all at Polar Park in 2022. So, again, uh, on behalf of uh, myself, Jim Kane, our special guest, guest Keith Folk, uh, thank you all for joining us. And everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of the show today. Take care.